Good morning and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today for our time together in the Word of God. Next Sunday, Lord willing, we will return to our study through the book of Genesis. Uh, but today, our focus is going to be on missions. For the last several weeks, missions and missionaries have been on my mind and my heart. Several weeks ago, we had the privilege as a church uh, to partner with and begin supporting two new missionaries here at our church, the Andrew Gonerman family, who are missionaries to Japan, and also Jeff and Sherry Newman and their ministry of encouragement and counsel to missionaries. It was my privilege and joy to contact them and let them know that we had voted as a church to begin this partnership with them. This past Sunday, we had the privilege as a church to commission or send missionaries from our church, Nathan and Christy Robbins and family, to Buffalo, New York, to plant a Bible-believing church in that city. What a privilege to partner with them as their sending church in this ministry. And those, these are just three of the missionary families that God has allowed us as a church to partner with in their ministries through our prayers, our finances, and our encouragement. Uh, here at our church today, I have a list of our missionary partners that's in the bulletin. I hope that if you're connected with our church here, that you will consider each of these missionaries to be not only partners in ministry, but also our friends. Back in June, Sandy, my wife, and I had the joy of visiting Buffalo, New York, and the surrounding area with Nathan and Christy to see firsthand the area in which they will be ministering. We stayed in the home of Christy's parents, which is about an hour from Buffalo, and attended Christy's home church on Sunday. When the pastor had heard that we were going to be there, he asked me ahead of time to to speak on that Sunday morning, uh, to share my perspective as uh, the sending church pastor for Nathan and Christy, and to talk to their church family about their, re their relationship and their responsibility to Nathan and Christy and family as one of their supporting churches. It was a joy to prepare and then share with that church family at Delavan Baptist Church in Delavan, New York. What I shared that day applies not only to Delavan Baptist Church's relationship with Nathan and Christy Robbins, but also to uh, their relationship with all of their missionaries. And so it applies to any church's relationship to any and all of their missionaries. I decided that it was important to share these truths with our church family as well. And so this Sunday, a week after our commissioning or sending Sunday, uh, is a good Sunday to review these truths and apply them to our ongoing ministry with and our ongoing ministry to our missionary family here at Faith Baptist Church of Camp Point. I want us to realize that our missionaries are partners and friends, not just names on a list of of people that we send money to. A missionary's life is built on relationships. It begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ, which is the foundation and reason for their ministry. It's the gospel message of forgiveness and eternal life through faith in Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection that changes the life of the missionary and gives him or her the the desire and the ability to serve in the first place. It's the gospel message and the relationship with Jesus that, that comes from the gospel that's at the center of their message and their ministry. Because of this relationship with Jesus Christ uh, that has prepared them and led them into missionary service, there are a number of other relationships that are a part of a missionary's life. There's the relationship that they have with their mission. Our missionaries here serve with a variety of missions, and we have those on that sheet in our bulletin today. Missions like Baptist missions and Continental Baptist missions 
and the Association of Baptists for World Evangelism. While the missionary's relationship with the mission is in part a relationship of accountability, it is more a, a relationship of counsel and guidance and support. The missionary is not an employee of the mission, but rather the mission provides spiritual, practical, and legal help to the missionary and to other local churches as they go out to minister. The missionary also has a relationship with their sending church. We have the privilege of being the sending church for Nathan and Christy Robbins to Buffalo, New York. We're also the sending church for our retired missionaries, Tom and Nancy Farlow, who were missionaries in Brazil, South America. And you may know that we also were the sending church for Heidi Robbins when she ministered in Peru in South America as well. Each of the missionaries in our missionary family has a sending church that sent them out to their ministry, just like we did last Sunday for Nathan and Christy. This relationship is a relationship of membership, accountability, protection, counsel, and direction, as well as a relationship of love and support as the missionary partners with their sending church in the ministry of missions, whether it be church planting or medical missions or support ministry. The missionary also has multiple relationships with support partners, churches, and individuals that partner with the missionary to pray for them and financially support them in their ministry of missions. This relationship also includes accountability, love, and support. There's also relationships that come when the missionary begins their on-site ministry. They'll need to learn the language if their ministry is in a foreign country, and they'll develop relationships in the community that, that will become a part of their that they will become a part of. In a church planting ministry, they'll develop relationships within the community with the purpose of seeking to make disciples that they will gather and build into a local church. Then they'll have the relationship with that local church as, as leader and servant and advisor to the church as it grows to become an independent, autonomous group. All of these relationships are in addition to the relationships that continue with, for the missionary uh, with their friends and their family from many locations as they relocate from their home location to their ministry location. So every missionary has lots of relationships. But this morning I want to talk to you about our relationships, about your relationships with our missionaries, the ones that are part of our missionary family, the missionaries that God has allowed us to partner with and support as part of our church family. I'd like to invite you to open your Bible with me, if you have one available, to the book of Philippians. In the book of Philippians, I believe we can find six ways that we can and should be an encouragement and help to our missionaries in our relationship with them as partners and friends. We find these six ways in the example of the relationship that Paul had with the church at Philippi. The church at Philippi wasn't Paul's home church or his sending church. He was sent out by the church at Antioch, as it tells us in Acts chapter 13. But the church at Philippi was a supporting or partnering church with Paul. And the church at Philippi also happened to be a church that Paul had planted as part of his ministry as an apostolic missionary. The first way that we can be an encouragement and help to our missionaries is to know them personally. Paul had planted the church at Philippi on his second missionary journey. Acts 16 tells us this, and that would have been around 50 A.D., he was probably there about three months. He visited there again briefly on his third journey, according to Acts chapter 20, and that would have been about uh, 55 or 56 AD. Some speculate that he visited there uh, again in around 65 or 68 AD on, on a fourth missionary journey. 
He was now writing this letter from prison, and it would have been about 61 or 62 AD. So he would have known at least some of this church family for over 10 years when he wrote this letter. Paul had taught them, he'd worshipped with them, he'd worked with them, and he had simply lived with them over a period of time. And that's how you get to know people personally. Paul referred to this time spent together when he wrote in chapter 4, verse 9, The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. Clearly, from the text of the book of Philippians, Paul and the Philippians knew each other well. In chapter 1, Paul thanks God for their fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. In chapter 4, verse 1, he calls them, My beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown. In verse 21 of chapter 4, he sends his greetings to every saint. Paul knew them because he had spent time with them. He probably also knew them from correspondence with them. They may have written to him, and this may not have been the only letter that Paul wrote to them. He knew them personally, and that knowledge included not only the blessings, but also the challenges, as, as we can see in the words that Paul wrote. When it comes to our relationship with our missionaries, we need to work at knowing them personally. That takes some effort. You get to know your missionaries as you carefully read their prayer letters and their emails. We post those letters from our missionaries on the bulletin board here, and we also include them in the Wednesday prayer email. But I encourage you from our church to sign up personally for the email updates from our missionaries. If you need help with that, I'd be happy to help you sign up for them. You also get to know our missionaries when they visit our church. And I encourage you to take the time to visit with them before and after the service. Better yet, have missionaries into your home for a meal or take them out to eat. Sitting at a table with someone and chatting with them is the best way to get to know them personally. Uh, to help you know how to minister to them and encourage them in the days ahead, get to know their strengths and their weaknesses, their likes and their dislikes, their interests and their hobbies. Some of our missionaries are, are recent additions to our missionary family, and so we need to make an effort to get to know them better personally. Some of our missionaries have been a part of our missionary family for a long time, but we can always get to know them better. When it comes to our missionaries, we need to work at knowing them personally. A second way that we can be an encouragement and help to our missionaries is to communicate with them regularly. Obviously, this is a wonderful way to get them to know them personally as well. Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians to communicate to them his love, his concern, his needs, and his challenges. It was a letter, so it was meant to be read. I believe it's also obvious here that Paul had received communication from the church at Philippi as well. In chapter 4, verse 18, he refers to the things sent from you with Epaphroditus. Now that, of course, would include financial support, but it very likely could have included some correspondence as well. Paul knew it was happening in Philippi. For instance, he knew that there was some division in the church, specifically be, between Euodia and Syntyche. In the same way, communication with our missionaries is a two-way street. Our missionaries send out regular prayer letter updates. They send them with the hope and expectation that they'll be read. Some of our missionaries put some posts on Facebook periodically too. And if you use that form of social media, I encourage you to read their posts and to like them. Periodically, our missionaries will visit our church and report on their ministry in person. Try to be here when missionaries visit and and share their mission, ministry updates. As I mentioned earlier, if possible, have them into your home or take them out for a meal and spend some quality time communicating with them about life and ministry. Then take some time to communicate yourself with our missionaries. If you read their prayer update or on email, take a moment to pray 
and then hit reply and send them a brief note. When you see their posts on Facebook, take a moment to write a little note under their post. Send them a card for their birthdays and anniversaries and uh, you also can, uh, if you know them personally, I should say, to, to know the dates of their birthdays and anniversaries, but make sure to sign the birthday and anniversary cards uh, that we have here at church as well. Send them a text or give them a call once in a while. Send them a postcard to let them know that you're praying for them, which is much appreciated. And we have postcards here at church that you can take that are addressed already to our missionaries and tell them, you write them a note and tell them that they're praying for them. We can do some things as a church as well. Communicating with our missionaries is not a hard thing to do. It just takes time. So know them personally and communicate with them regularly. A third way to encourage and help our missionaries is to love them joyfully. It's obvious in the book of Philippians that Paul had a great love for his friends in Philippi, whom he knew well and communicated with regularly. Listen to what he wrote. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine making requests for you all with joy. Chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. I have you in my heart, he wrote. For God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. That's chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. In chapter 4, verse 1, he refers to them as my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown. Clearly, Paul had great love for these believers. And by the way, and by the way that the Philippians ministered to Paul, uh, and we'll say more on this in a bit, but they loved Paul as well. This mutual love for one another that's expressed in Philippians was also the source of great joy. How do we refer to the book of Philippians? It's the epistle of joy. I hope that it's easy for you to love our missionaries. They're part of our church family. I know that many of you have known some of our missionaries for a number of years and They've become close personal friends, which also helps our love for them to grow. Our love for our missionaries is based on our love for Jesus Christ. That's why Paul wrote, I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. How can we encourage and help our missionaries? Know them personally, communicate with them regularly, and love them joyfully. Now, before we move on to the fourth way that we can encourage our missionaries, I want to add a reminder about something that I touched on in the introduction that applies to these first three encouragements. That reminder is about the importance of accountability. Included in knowing, loving, and communicating with our missionaries, especially missionaries that we have sent from our church, is the ministry of accountability. Missionaries are sent out by and supported by local churches. Therefore, they're accountable to these local churches. In fact, their accountability to their partnering churches, especially to their sending church, becomes, uh, comes before their accountability to the mission. Accountability adds to the importance of knowing the missionaries and communicating with them. And we're really showing our love for them when we hold them accountable for their ministry. It's our responsibility to love them by way of counsel and advice as we communicate with them about their ministry and as they seek counsel and advice from us. This is an important way that we joyfully share our love for our missionaries. Now on to the fourth way that we can and should be an encouragement and help to our missionaries, and that is to pray for them faithfully. It's clear from the book of Philippians that Paul prayed for the church at Philippi. He says in, as much in chapter 1, verse 4, Always in every prayer of mine making requests for you all with joy. And he shares how he prayed for them in chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. 
I'm sure the Philippians were encouraged by Paul's prayer for them. <coughs> Excuse me. But what about their prayers for Paul? Paul knew that they were praying for him too. He writes in verse 19 of chapter 1, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. We need to be praying faithfully for our missionaries. We'll be able to pray best for our missionaries when we know them personally, communicate with them regularly, and love them joyfully. But praying for our missionaries needs to go beyond praying for what we read about in a prayer letter. Paul gives us some insight into how to pray for missionaries in a couple of his other letters, not to the Philippians, but to other partnering churches. To the Colossians, he wrote, Meanwhile, praying also for us, that God would open to us a door for the word, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. That's Colossians 4, verses 3 and 4. We need to pray that God would open doors for each of our missionaries to make the gospel clear and that people would respond in faith to the gospel. Then to the Thessalonians, Paul wrote, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified, just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. That's in, I believe, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Pray that God's word would be glorified as our missionaries communicate it and that there would be minimal opposition to their work of the ministry because, as Paul said, not all have faith. Financial support is great, and it's part of the next point, but I think that our missionaries would agree with me that before you give to them financially or physically, Give to them spiritually through your prayers, which leads to the fifth way that we can be an encouragement and help to our missionaries, and that is to invest in them generously. Philippi was a giving church, and we see this in the way that they invested in Paul's ministry. They invested financially in Paul's ministry. He writes to them, You have done well that you shared in my distress. When I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. That's chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. They also invested in other ways in Paul's ministry, most notably by sending Epaphroditus to help and minister to Paul. Chapter 2, 20, verse 25 refers to Epaphroditus as your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. He also tells how hard Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus worked. He came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. That's chapter 2, verse 30. Then in chapter 4, verse 18, Paul refers to the things sent from you with Epaphroditus. As I mentioned earlier, this could have been letters along with finances and perhaps other things that Paul needed. The point is that the church in Philippi invested generously in the ministry of Paul, both before he was put in prison and after he was put in prison, where he still had tremendous missionary ministry. This is a challenge to us to invest generously in the ministry of the missionaries that God gives us to partner with. Our investment will, of course, include finances, both monthly financial support and our special gifts as there are needs and we are able to give. <coughs> our investment should also include people and time and labor to help to do the work of the ministry as we are able. Occasionally, there are opportunities to visit our missionaries on site and help them with their ministry. Our missionaries are, are thankful for our financial support, but when there's hands-on physical investment of time and ministry as it is expressed and needed, it can mean even more. And the bonus is that you get to know them better, get to grow to love them more, and You'll want to communicate with them more and pray, and will pray for them more. Investing generously can mean a lot of things, but just as the Philippian church invested generously in the ministry of Paul, 
we should be willing to invest generously as well. One final way that we can encourage and help our missionaries is to stay unified for them biblically. Paul's desire for the church at Philippi was that they be a unified body of believers. He wrote to them in chapter 2, verse 2, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. It's clear from this letter that Paul wasn't just talking about getting along, although that was certainly part of it. He was also concerned that they be unified in their faithfulness to the word of God and to sound doctrine. This comes out clearly in chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of, of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or, and, or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Paul challenges them to be unified in their commitment to sound doctrine, the faith of the gospel, and to good conduct, stand fast in one spirit. He knew that good conduct follows good, con good doctrine. Paul was telling them that the best way to fulfill his joy, the best way to encourage him, was to remain faithful to the doctrine and conduct that they had been taught and that was the foundation of their church. Do you want to encourage your missionaries? Then as a church, always remain faithful to God's word, to sound doctrine, and to good conduct that's based upon God's word and sound, sound doctrine. Stay uniform, unified for your missionaries biblically. As our missionaries strive to establish local churches that are built upon God's word, sound doctrine, and good conduct, they want to know that the churches that have partnered with them, especially their home churches, are staying faithful and unified in their commitment to God's word, sound doctrine, and good conduct. A church cannot hold a missionary accountable to something that's not true for that church itself. This morning we began with the reminder that a missionary's life is built on relationships. Starting with a relationship with Jesus Christ and then including relationships with a mission, with ascending church, with partnering churches and individuals, with a new community, with a new ministry, and continuing relationships with friends and families. God calls some to be full-time vocational missionaries, to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ full-time. We have the privilege to be partners and friends with some of these missionaries. And my desire and prayer is that we would be a help and encouragement to our missionaries in the ways that we have looked at today to know them personally, to communicate with them regularly, to love them joyfully, to pray for them faithfully, to invest in them generously, and to stay unified for them biblically. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to partner with servants who are serving you full-time in missionary ministry work. And I pray, the Lord, that we would take to heart these thoughts today, that just as Paul had a, a helpful and encouraging relationship with the church at Philippi, that, that we as a church will want to be helpful and to encourage our missionary partners, our missionary family as well. Thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord, that is what unifies us. And I pray that as they take the gospel around the world, that there will be those who hear who understand and who believe and who commit their life to Jesus Christ for forgiveness and eternal life. And even someone listening today, Lord, if they have not put their faith in Jesus, that they would do that today. Lord, help us to be faithful as missionaries right where you put each of us. But Lord, also uh, help us be faithfully and encouraging those who you by your grace have called to go to other places. Thank you, Lord, that the gospel is the same wherever we take it because it's founded on Jesus who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I know this message was a little bit different, a little bit different focus. Next Sunday, Lord willing, we'll return to our study through the book of Genesis. But until then, stay faithful, stay in God's word, and I hope that you'll join me again next week. Goodbye.